By the mid-1920s, the Nazi party is in serious decline. Adolf Hitler knows that in order to lead his party to power, he needs to take the legitimate approach. The Nazis need to shake off their image of thuggery, violence and revolution. They have to be seen as respectable and democratic. They've got to look like they are working within the political system and that they are a real and credible political party and not just a bunch of lunatics who try to seize beer halls in Munich. With Germany now seemingly prosperous under a democratic government, Hitler realizes that the only way he can take power is to win the hearts and minds of the German people in an election. To kick off their charm offensive, the Nazi party needs an image overhaul. And it begins with Hitler himself. For help, he turns to his Lebensraum guru, Dr. Karl Haushofer. He was a major influence, not simply in ideas, but in technique of presentation. This notion that presentation is everything in politics. Haushofer helps to construct a series of new looks for Hitler to make him appeal to as many people across Germany as possible. He can either present the kind of traditional German folkish figure in lederhosen and the long socks and the walking shoes, and that appeals to a certain element of the community. He can also look much more technocratic, and he can wear a very smart lounge suit. And if he's at a great Nazi rally, he's in his uniform. But it's not only his appearance that Hitler wants to improve. To keep his head clear and his voice protected after long speeches, Haushofer replaces Hitler's steins of strong Bavarian beer with cups of herbal tea. But most importantly, he trains Hitler in the art of public speaking, teaching him ways to gesticulate, to emphasize his arguments, and increase his self-confidence. The idea of, of how to deliver a speech, to whom are you speaking? Adjust your tone, your manner, your style to the audience, and then you'll win them over. He starts to practice in front of the mirror. He practices some of his gesticulations in front of the mirror. His gesture, that famous one with the hand going back, um, and, and how it went to pause in a speech. He has a series of photographs taken so that he can see which gesticulations work best in his speeches. So he's really into the idea of image. It's, it's easy to poo-poo that and think that this is a vain and self-obsessed thing to do, which of course Hitler was, but at the same time it makes total sense. If oratory is one of your hallmarks, you've got to get it right. So why not practice in front of the mirror? With a new glossy image, Hitler now needs someone to sell it. He's already found the perfect person. Failed writer, Joseph Goebbels. It's hard to imagine a less perfect form of Nordic Superman than Joseph Goebbels. If anybody doesn't look like a Nazi, it's Goebbels. He's short, he's slight, he's physically imperfect because he's got a club foot, and he's also really quite ugly. But what he has is a very quick mind. He's a PhD in philology, and he recognizes the power of propaganda and words. With hang-ups about his height, his disability, and his rejection from the German army because of it, he also despises the Weimar government. 
He came from a very poor Catholic background, but he'd uh, fallen out with the Catholic Church. He was a man of great intelligence and talent, but in search of a direction. It's his gift for flattery that first gets him noticed. In a letter prompted by Hitler's speeches during his trial for the Beer Hall Putsch, Goebbels had written, Like a rising star, you appeared before our wandering eyes. You performed miracles to clear our minds and, in a world of skepticism and desperation, gave us faith. You named the need of a whole generation. One day Germany will thank you. It was not, in fact, for another 15 months that he met Hitler for the first time in the summer of 1925. And then he said, he's everything I had hoped for. He's, he's all that he had hoped for and more. Once he came under Hitler's spell, he developed a schoolgirl crush on, on this man. In an entry in his diary on the 23rd of November, 1925, Goebbels writes, Great joy. He greets me like an old friend. How I love him. He gives me his photograph with a greeting to the Rhineland. Heil Hitler. I want Hitler to be my friend. In order to rebrand the entire Nazi party, Hitler recognizes he needs the help of a man like Goebbels. A lot of the Nazi party regarded Goebbels as the truly brilliant one amongst the Nazis. He was very quick-witted. He doesn't have this lumpen, cliched Prussian German way of doing things by the book. He's also enormously hardworking. He's a tremendously energetic man, ready to work long, long hours, to travel incessantly. He's a much more resourceful figure if there's a problem, Goebbels will be very good at fixing it. Goebbels will be the man to go to. With restrictions still placed on the party in many places across Germany, Hitler needs someone who can attract new voters. Goebbels was a man who understood intuitively modern methods of propaganda. We see a shift towards the print media by necessity because Hitler's prevented from giving those public speeches, but that then sets the tone for very much. A whole range of Nazi newspapers, Nazi magazines emerge. The Nazis are right there leading from the front when it comes to the pioneering use on leaflets, in illustrated papers, on election posters. Hitler's so impressed by Goebbels, in November 1926, he hands him the important role of taking the Nazi party message to the nation's capital, Berlin. Berlin had a reputation then as a communist stronghold, a trade unionist stronghold, and Goebbels therefore was tasked by Hitler with a very difficult mission. Berlin always left wing in sympathies. The eastern side of the city certainly, to a large degree, controlled by the communists. And it became Goebbels' job to win Red Berlin for the Nazis and to wean it away from communism. Goebbels has lorries scatter leaflets through the city streets, pastes the city walls with red swastikas and posters, and uses his Berlin newspaper, Der Angriff, the attack, to feed Hitler's political ideology to the masses. But he also uses another great talent. Speech making. The ban on public speaking is lifted in 1927. Goebbels now becomes a regular speech maker for the Nazis. He himself was second only to Hitler in his oratory. Uh, although a small, unimpressive man physically, he could electrify an audience with his passion and his oratory. So he was an extremely valuable man to have on Hitler's side. 
where Hitler's style is aggressive and passionate. Goebbels is sharp-tongued and sarcastic. Goebbels thrived in a confrontational atmosphere. He was at his best in a smoky hall with his opponents present. His speeches were long, they were often erudite, but they were also witty and entertaining, and he had a particular ability to put down hecklers. But behind the smart exterior, Goebbels is a thug. He and his Nazi party bully boys, the SA brown shirts, regularly provoke the opposition parties with the aim of causing bloodshed. Goebbels SA specialised at going into working class areas of Berlin, holding speeches and events which they knew would rouse the ire of the left-leaning local paramilitaries. This could be guaranteed to cause a fight. They battled it out literally in the streets using uh, coshes, using chair legs, using bottles and beer mugs. They even shot and stabbed each other on the street. Unhesitatingly, Goebbels used violence to achieve his end. While Goebbels is busy sorting out the German capital, back in Munich, Hitler is working on the final touches to his image. He wants something that will set him apart. As the aspiring ruler of Germany, Hitler is looking to create his own special bodyguard. The obvious group to recruit from are the SA brown shirts, but they're seen as too thuggish. He needs something more elite, more presidential. Enter the Schutzstaffel, Hitler's new protection force, or SS. The SS are meant to be the ideal of German manhood. Membership is restricted only to those who can trace their Aryan ancestry back to the 18th century. You could compare the SS to a kind of imperial guard from ancient Rome. They were the tallest, the best, the fittest, and they were dressed in these immaculate black uniforms. The distinctive uniforms which Hitler will eventually put them in are made by clothes designer and Nazi party member Hugo Boss. Nothing is more striking in Nazi propaganda than the outfit of the SS. Meant to be daunting, meant to be frightening. You had to wear black boots. You had to have black breeches. And they also have this skull and crossbones emblem, the Totenkopf. The Totenkopf is meant to symbolize strength and purpose, loyalty, and commitment unto death. With a fast evolving party image, a powerful propaganda machine behind them, and the 1928 election on the horizon. At last, Hitler can put his new-look Nazis to the test. Hey, 